Um, I, I have a story to tell, and the story is, is really about uh, my company, Siemens. I'm not really here in an official capacity. I'm not a spokesperson for Siemens. But I think there's an interesting story about one company's efforts to, to deliver uh, solutions uh, towards a sustainable future. Um, I did want to. On the Is that better? Is that better? Yeah, that is better. Um, I got into this business purely by accident. Um, 25 years ago, as a student at Penn State uh, University, I I only knew that I was interested in in being in engineering. Um, I think I originally expected to, to be a civil engineer. It made a lot of sense to me. And, uh, and I went to, to Penn State as a freshman and planned on entering the civil engineering program. And, and there I found out that they had another program called architectural engineering, uh, which sounded all so much better. And best yet, it was a five-year major, so I could hide out one more year in college and enjoy myself. So I switched from civil to architectural engineering and within that, there were a number of different opportunities. There was the civil engineering aspect with the structures, and then there was project management, and then there was this other aspect, this environmental engineering, which had to do with designing the, the spaces, not the physical spaces, not the architectural part of a building, but the, the, the comfort and environment, the, the temperature, the uh, electrical distribution system. So it was the environmental design part. And uh, I really wasn't planning on going into that until uh, someone walked into one of my sophomore classes and announced that there was a $5,000 scholarship for the winner of the essay who was going to go into the environmental studies group. So I decided that I would write my essay and, and if I won the essay and got the $5,000 then I was going to end up doing, uh, doing the environmental angle. And I did. So. 25 years later, I find myself uh, continuing to be involved in the engineering aspects of, of buildings and architecture. And, and after originally doing just traditional MEP design work uh, as, a, as a partner to architects on new construction projects, I quickly found out that there was this other avenue to, to express myself, to work, and to be productive, and it was around energy efficiency of, of existing buildings. And so for the last 18 so years, I've essentially focused on delivering energy efficiency retrofits to buildings. And it's been very rewarding. Um, in the last 18 months, I've come to work here at Siemens. And uh, I've learned a lot about what uh, Siemens is trying to accomplish globally in context to sustainability. Uh, just a quick show of hands, does, does everyone know who Siemens is? Still not good? Do you want me to turn it off and go to the other one? Yeah? yeah? All right. Whoa. Okay, so does everyone know who Siemens is? Would it surprise you if I told you that Siemens was the sixth largest employer on Earth with 400,000 employees globally? Um, I was surprised um, myself, um, even though I'm in the engineering field. So uh, Siemens is, in many ways, uh, sort of the GE of Europe. And uh, out of those 400,000 employees, uh, probably more than half are engineers in, in almost every capacity, from, from management to sales to engineering to, to law and what have you. So, um, and, and Siemens, first and foremost, is, is an engineering company and a technology company, and it's existed for 165 years, and we've invented uh, an, any number of very important uh, products that you probably have experienced almost every day. Um, my father has a Siemens hearing aid. Uh, if anyone's had an MRI at a hospital, it might have been in a Siemens MRI. Um, we make everything from uh, electrical switchgear and large steam turbines to uh, inverters that allow direct current from photovoltaic panels to be transitioned to alternating current. So it, we make an enormous number of different products that you don't see, they're not on the shelf at the grocery store, but they're a part of your life every day. And um, 
along the way, Siemens has, uh, Siemens has made a conscious effort to reorganize and focus our, our sales and our business on a sustainable, uh, a sustainable business offering because uh, we see that this is where the, the customer's demands are, are, are driving and driving us. So uh, we have gone through the very interesting process that I'm going to outline here. Um, and I'll try not to go into the too great and boring detail, but there, I think there is a very interesting story to tell here about how Siemens has decided to uh, listen to what the future uh, needs of the planet and, and the organizations and people on the planet are, uh, to understand uh, where the future needs are going and, and then reorganizing our business to best accommodate those needs. Um, this would be funny if it wasn't really sad in a lot of ways, but this is, this is the truth, right? The, the, the challenges that we face, the climate challenges that we face, don't seem to get traction all by themselves. When you talk about the fact that the, the things that are happening on this earth could plausibly affect human existence, and, and the, the fact that no one seems to want to take action on that seems very puzzling. But the reality is people and businesses react to economic stimuli. And when you translate the challenges into economics, people understand that and they know how to respond. And so although this slide may be sad, maybe it's funny, I think it's really true. And, and we're going to talk throughout the evening about economic stimuli and, and how that can drive the outcomes that, that I may want or you may want. So um, part one. So the first thing I wanted to do was talk about Siemens, uh, our pursuit of understanding of the challenges, uh, to understand the challenges that our customers face and understand the implications of those challenges. So here's a little bit of information that, that we think is relevant to our business. Um, first is population growth. Uh, I think we all know that population is a population growth is, is going to be a challenge in the future, but you know the anticipation is is an additional 2.5 billion people by 2050. That's that's a lot of more people competing for limited resources. Um, Cities are going to play a greater and greater role. I mean, obviously, we've already seen the evolution uh, away from the rural areas and into cities, and that is just to con continue to accelerate and create uh, greater and greater challenges as, uh, that come along with, with density and urban density um, and, and the economic benefits and the challenges as well. Um, the cities that we're talking about that we're really going to be focusing on uh, constitute only 1% of the Earth's surface, but will have 50% of the world's population and consume 75% of the world's energy and also produce 75% of the carbon dioxide. Um, we really see that there are, there are three types of cities starting now, right? One is the developed cities, and we all know what those are. Um, and in those, there's, there's quality of life issues, there's, there's benefits of being a part of, a, of a, an, an elaborate and established city, and it is attractive for companies and industries to be a part of that, simply because of the infrastructure. Uh, the challenges are, there are sustainability channel, challenges, and, and as these cities, these established cities, the New Yorks, the LAs, the Chicagos, you know, they are getting older and older, and critical infrastructure of the city um, are really in need of replacement. Uh, and then we see mega cities or uncontrolled growth cities um, that perhaps we see in countries, uh, developing countries like, like India and China, where there's almost uncontrolled growth. And uh, there's, a, or there's a massive and rapid buildup of infrastructure, and there's incredible challenges around pollution and congestion. And you know, we've all seen the YouTube video of the, of the rush hour traffic in some random city in China where everyone's stuck for 72 straight hours in their, in their cars and trucks. 
And, and that, that is a challenge with cities that, that grow almost instantaneously. And then the future, the future cities where they're planned cities, and, and really Irvine is really a planned city, uh, where, where um, it, it wasn't just natural growth. It was, it was planned in advance by someone thinking uh, beforehand and allowing things to grow in a very structured manner. Uh, but these future cities, uh, even though they're going to be planned, they're going to continue to be challenged because of the limitations on natural resources, uh, specifically energy and water. So um, these cities that Siemens is focusing on, uh, this represents um, this represents 49% uh, of the population today, uh, and it represents 51% of the GDP, and uh, and in the future, uh, not only will a, a large portion of GDP come from these mega cities and these established cities, there's an anticipation that these middleweight cities, these emerging cities, will actually become to dominate and, and, have, and represent 40% of GDP worldwide. So tremendous economic drivers in these developing cities as well. So the challenges that these cities face, especially in, in uh, the United States, are can usually be boiled down to economic challenges, demographic challenges, and sustainability, sustainability challenges. Um, economic challenges uh, is something that we're all living through right now. You know, we've had a dramatic downturn in the economy over the last five to six years, and it's significantly impacted the ability of cities to deliver services to their, to their citizens and just to remain solvent. Uh, here in Southern California, we've seen several cities actually go bankrupt, including the city of San Bernardino, for example. Um, very significant problems. Uh, demographic problems, uh, we're going to look at a slide here in a second on this. There's a tremendous amount of uh, po population migration, not only from rural to urban, but also from north to south, right? The, the historical population centers of, of America were the for the, the Northeast and the Rust Belt, and now you're seeing a tremendous amount of movement away from those uh, population centers and into places like Southern California and inland Southern California and uh, Arizona, for example, and we'll see that in a bit. Um, and this hasn't, the sustainability part hasn't quite come home to roost yet, but there's continuing to be pressure on, on scarcity of natural resources. You're seeing a lot more uh, infighting uh, for resources between cities, for example, the Colorado River water is 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 something that you know cities in Southern California and cities in Arizona and Nevada. I mean, they're everyone's fighting to get more more a greater part of that water than they're currently getting, and there's only so much to go around. Um, and again, as was previous slide pointed out, you know these cities are responsible for 75 percent of greenhouse gas production worldwide. Um, and, and then finally, you know, these cities are also not only they competing for resources, they're competing for business, right? They, you, and you see this every day um, here in the Western United States. Uh, states like Nevada are constantly trying to poach California companies by luring them across the border with, um, with tax incentives, with, with a different uh, income tax structure. And, uh, and, and there's certainly a certain number of cities or a certain number of businesses are going to take advantage of that. So as taxes in places like California and Massachusetts and New York are going up, you know, those other areas of the country, uh, the Nevadas, the Arizonas, the Texas, and the Oklahomas, they're dropping, they're dropping taxes and trying to get more of the resources and more of the businesses that drive jobs and create uh, wealth into their, into their areas. Um, we talked about this economic challenge. Uh, this really highlights it, though. You could see where after 2007, you know, the, the income for a lot of these uh, municipalities really kind of fell off a cliff. Um, and that was really driven primarily in California by the drop in property taxes, drop in, um, in uh, income taxes, and the drop in sales tax, all of which happened really simultaneously. Now, the good news is that since uh, this slide and this graph was created, we've already started to see that turn a corner. And you know, the state is much more solvent. Uh, cities and counties are rebounding. Uh, school districts, through things like um, um, Prop 39, uh, 
uh, it's allowing it's allowing them to recover, and and they're getting stronger. But they still have a tremendous amount of pressure um, to cut costs, to cut services, and to cut employees. So they have these these simultaneous pressures, and and at the same time, um, people still want to have services delivered. Um, this is a great graph to highlight that demographic issue I was telling you about before. Just in a book, just to simplify it, the 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 purple is is negative growth, and the and the green and the darkest green is positive growth. And you can see all of the areas, the, the rural areas of the uh, central United States in dark purple, and you can see the the Rust Belt area up through Ohio and uh, the Great Lakes area, very purple, and uh, and a lot of green down in places like Florida. Texas, Arizona, Nevada, and, and inland Southern California. So um, the, these population migrations also create a lot of pressure for, for communities. So now that Siemens started out by doing this research on what the challenges are, now we, we started to invest money in doing detailed studies and doing studies to understand what our customers are specifically going to be motivated by. So we did this in... in uh, two ways with two different studies. And then we also um, started doing uh, 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 almost like um, uh, sustainability outreach. And one of the ways we did this was through a building that we built uh, in London uh, in preparation for the London Olympics. It's called the Crystal. I'll show you a few slides about that. And, uh, and part of the responsibility of the Crystal is, is to really be an education center worldwide on the topics of sustainability. And, and I'm going to show a quick video called Future Life that was developed by the Crystal and is shown. And if you ever get a chance uh, to go, you, you should get the opportunity. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the Siemens Green City Index. This is a study that we commissioned to, uh, to, to understand uh, and evaluate cities across, in this case, North America. We do the same thing in uh, Africa and Europe and Asia. So uh, this one particular study is about the U.S. and Canada. And basically what we're doing here is we evaluated 27 cities. Uh, we collected data from public sources, and we basically uh, create a measurement that they can compare themselves on a number of, of, um, a, a number of areas to determine their overall sustainable uh, activity and their rank against each other. Um, so the areas that we, we, uh, we examined... Uh, was uh, carbon dioxide emissions and reduction strategies, energy and energy efficiency, land use, uh, the, the buildings and building codes, transportation, uh, water and availability of, of clean water, waste and the handling of waste, and then air quality in general, and then environmental guide, or excuse me, environmental governance. So, um, all of those all of those categories were were scored, and then an overall score was given, and then ranked. So the results were perhaps not too surprising, but um, some of the top performers were cities that you would expect to be at the top of the list. Cities like San Francisco, Vancouver, who are very well known as being uh, havens for uh, leaders of environmentalism and sustainability. Uh, you know, other cities that. Uh, maybe you're surprised to see you'd be New York, but you know New York because of its long history of being incredibly densely populated, from you know the, from several hundred years ago, uh, it has a much more established transportation system that allows it to score extremely well in those other categories. Um, the cities that were underperforming, not surprising. There's a lot of Rust Belt cities there. My hometown of Pittsburgh is landed, you know, strongly at 23. A lot of pride there. Um, but also, uh, you know, and, and the, interesting, the interesting comparison is, is when you compare uh, this graph to this chart, right? Try to remember that. I'm going to flip back. So, you know, a lot of the top performers are in those green areas. People are moving to places like San Francisco and Vancouver. Uh, New York is still actually green. Denver is green. Boston is, is about equal. Los Angeles is green. Um, and most of the bottom performers are the are the purple ones, the places where people are actually moving away, where people are, you know, the populations are shrinking. Detroit, in particular, is an amazing example of a population that's just disappearing. And uh, 
you know, there, there's a number of reasons for that. A lot of it is economic, but a lot of it is also quality of life. So uh, key findings from our report is that wealth obviously helps the, the, the very wealthy, large communities on that list, the San Francisco's, the Vancouver's, and New York's. Obviously, that helps a lot, but it's not a prerequisite. Uh, effective planning really matters. Um, and a comprehensive perspective is critical. Um, and persistence is, is essential. Um, I think ultimately it comes down to a commitment to provide the citizens with the transportation needs that they really need to live their lives. And if you can, you can, you can, if you can deliver the transportation that they need in a, in a mass transportation that allows them to get out of the cars, I think that in and of itself goes a long way because a lot of the cities you see on that on that uh, top performing list are, are cities with very strong public transportation systems. Um, other key findings, um, it goes beyond physical characteristics. Uh, there are four very different cities on the top, New York, Vancouver, Denver, and Los Angeles. Uh, wealthy cities on both coasts rank near the top, not surprising. And Canadian cities rank higher than expected based on income. Um, also not too surprising in my mind simply because you know, you have a government that's much more hands-on and proactive than, than uh, American-style governance. So um, this was one study that we commissioned. Again, what's the point of this? The point of this is, is that these cities are really our customers. And we want to know, um, not only do we want to know what issues are driving and affecting these customers, we also want to uh, encourage some of those cities on the bottom of the list to take action to move to the top. Even cities that did very well, like Los Angeles, Mayor Villaraigosa was extremely adamant that he wanted to see Los Angeles move up into that, that top position or two. So, you know, as, as with anything, whether it's grades or a ranking like this, you know, competitive people want to want to win, right? So by giving a ranking, you're giving people motivation to want to take action. And of course, since we're met one of the companies that provide the solutions, uh, we're hoping that drives, drives action towards generating new business for us. So another study that we uh, commissioned, uh, in addition to the examination of, of the cities, is, is we wanted to examine uh, corporate philosophies and corporate perspectives um, to understand what's driving uh, our, our, our business partners to, to want to take action and, and move towards sustainable solutions as well. So we've actually done a reoccurring study every three years uh, that's really just a survey of, of chief executives from a number of, uh, of, of businesses. And the results are, are interesting. Um, it de generally it gauges the trends of sustainability uh, for some of the largest corporations in America. Um, again, this is the third time we've done it over a, over a seven year period. And uh, it's assessing how sustainability is practiced by incorporation and what, really what's behind it. Um, and finally, uh, it's exploring uh, the evolution of this new role that we've seen in the last 10 years, which is uh, the role of a corporate sustainability officer. Um, I don't want to dwell on these too much. Uh, there is a access. You could ac actually have access to this information. And I uh, uh, gave Professor Matthew uh, a document that he could share with you to go into this in greater detail. But you know, what you're going to see throughout these slides is a, is a general movement from 2006 to 2012 um, of, of more sustainable activity and, and practices. So uh, uh, for example, you know, the, the percentage of companies that responded with uh, sustainability officers, uh, we, we didn't even ask the question in 2006 because there were so few out there. And 22% uh, in 2009 responded that they, their companies did, in fact, have a chief sustainability officer. And, and in 2012, 32% did. So you're going to see that a lot over the next couple of slides. Um, the other thing we measured was, was uh, the stages of sustainability. Um, the earlier stages are basically non-existent. Sustainability doesn't exist as a part of the, of the organization's behavior. Uh, stage two is, is, is really in its, in its infancy. Um, green energy organization as, as a minimally legally required, all right? 
And so these types of organizations that are in stage one and stage two are going to look at environmental initiatives as a cost, something that have to a burden that they have to bear. Um, when you move into stage three, they're starting to become more proactive and they they starting to embrace the idea and the application of, of environmentalism to be consistent with their, their profit mission and and that they're starting to realize that sustainability in and of itself can be a money saver uh, for their organization. And then stages four and stages five is when, when these companies are fully embracing this and, and it's not just a cost saving opportunity for them, but it's actually a, an integral part of their, of their corporate strategy, both from a, from a marketing standpoint as well as an, an action standpoint. So uh, the next couple of slides are gonna show the range of activities from stages one through five. Again, stage one is essentially it's not existent, and stage five being fully embraced uh, as a part of their core uh, corporate philosophy. So this is a pretty pretty telling slide. The, bl the blue showing uh, uh, much more in stages one and two, uh, and then very few in stages four and five. Um, the, the light green being 2009, showing a more even bell curve distribution, and then the dark green showing, uh, compared to the blue, obviously a much greater shift towards the stages four and the stages five, where, where companies are really embracing sustainability as a core part of their, of their business. Um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna spend too much time on all of these, but some of these slides are, are worth noting. You know, th this slide between 2009 and 2012, just highlighting the, the, the changes and activities uh, broken down between waste reduction and recycling, uh, employee engagement in green activities, renewable energy, uh, green buildings and portfolio through LEED or, or um, Energy Star, um, and then at the bottom, uh, publishing annual sustainability reports. So you could see uh, a big difference between the 2000 and just to 2009 and the 2012. And, and this is something that is uh, not surprising, but good, good to see. So uh, this last slide here, uh, th this is another slide talking about the, the, res the emergence of a sustainability officer as being a part of uh, the le leadership of these, of these corporations and, uh, and how there's much more in, in, in the advanced stages of these corporations, you're seeing a lot more activity in uh, with chief sustainability officers. And a big difference if it's just a single person acting as a chief sustainability officer versus a chief sustainability officer with a, an actual dedicated staff that can allow that person to really take action and, and, and drive results. Um, you know. You know the uh, the thing the, the other thing that we're seeing is is people are realizing that it's not just about complying with regulation and it's not just about an opportunity to save money through cost savings. It's actually uh, a, a marketing benefit. And and as you as consumers uh, may are maybe more drawn to companies that tout themselves as being. Uh, environmental or environmentally active organizations and people are seeing that there's it's an improvement of their company image and therefore it helps drive actual direct sales um, oops. I'm gonna skip over a couple of these slides because I, I don't want to run out of time um, again there's there's a, an incredible uh, buy-in to the point of 96% of all company surveys that agree that one of the drivers for corporate sustainability is the ability to reduce energy and cost and generate real savings to the company. So the fact that we've gotten to the point where almost 100% of all respondents will, will say that that is a clear driver for corporate sustainability is great. I mean, it seems like a no-brainer, but 96% but is, is, is a great number to see. Um, interesting, there's still a lot of traction to be gained in context to things like staff retention. But uh, as, we, as we continue to do this report every three years, I'm confident that we're gonna see a lot more, uh, a higher number show up on the staff retention because I think that more and more people uh, wanna be a part of a company that is 
uh, strongly motivated by environmental um, uh, motives. Um, so the key takeaway from these reports, again, there's a series of them, is that sustainability is becoming business as usual. Firms are expecting significant benefits, benefits from sustainability beyond, beyond financial, um, and then sustainability is increasing in its role in corporate financial plans. Um, this report is available. You could access it yourself at this website. And uh, I also gave a copy of the 2009 report to Professor Matthew. So now that we've seen that, um, I want to talk about one way in which Siemens is, is taking this information and we're actually showcasing it in a way that everyone can see. This is a picture of the crystal on the Thames. Um, the crystal is a sustainable cities initiative by Siemens. And again, it was built in partnership with the government of the city of London in, in advance of the London Olympics. Um, the audience is urban, design, uh, urban decision makers and infrastructure experts and the general public. It has office space. It's also an exhibit and conference facility. It uh, has 100 desks. It's 2,000 square meters of ex exhibition space, 270 seat auditorium. Um, and, and it really is a, a conference center for sustainability for, for Siemens and for uh, London and the country of England in general. Um, it does meet the uh, outstanding classification from Bream and platinum uh, lead certification. And the way in which we've accomplished that is through uh, eight categories of efforts. Uh, the first is uh, state-of-the-art building management. This is uh, an integral part of what Siemens does, uh, building management systems or energy management systems, uh, the intelligence behind operating the, the energy systems within a building. Um, item number two, we, we worked with the architect to uh, create extensive use of natural light, which we then can uh, reduce the amount of artificial lighting through uh, lighting control systems. Um, low energy mixed mode ventilation, meaning natural ventilation. Uh, the more we could do to, to design buildings that accommodate natural airflow, it just reduces the amount of energy needed to drive fans, for example. Um, it, is, it is an all electric building. Um, it includes rainwater harvesting and recycling. It includes black water recycling. Uh, it has an extremely efficient heating system, and it includes multifaceted and sustainable landscape. Um, you can find information on this at uh, www.thecrystal.org, uh, and I encourage you to, to check it out online, and if you are in London, uh, please uh, drop by. It's someplace that's, that's really quite fascinating. I'll be in London in, in a week or so, and I'm going to be dropping by uh, myself, I have yet to see it. Um, one of the other things that that the crystal does is it's also, in many ways, Siemens' face for our our vision for the future, and and we've created a series of um, short movies uh, that look into some of the possible futures. And I wanted to show uh, one of them to you now, uh, just to see what you think of it. Seven oh three AM Central Park, New York. Within the city, there are now two million more inhabitants than at the beginning of the millennium. As the population grows, the city adapts. The spaces around us are flexible, changing to match our needs. We simply pay to use a space or an item, then give it back, move it on, or recycle after use. Many people work from home, switching between business and leisure, the real and the virtual. Individuals are important, but community is king. 10.19 a.m. Copenhagen. A surplus of energy has been generated, lowering prices. The smart grid responds, communicating with all producers and consumers. But the people in the city do not just consume electricity, they also generate and store it. The 
The smart grid directs drivers to buy energy off-peak when cost is low. The city makes energy miners and energy traders of us all. 2.21 p.m. Downtown New York. Sensors throughout New York provide information essential to its running and to keep people safe. This city is aware. Real-time information flows into the city cockpit. All data is integrated and visualized, enabling the city to run more efficiently. Traffic lights and information systems are adapted to allow traffic to flow smoothly. Citizens have a direct connection to public services and can participate at every level. This is a city that responds to the needs of its population. 4 p.m. Copenhagen. Parks are the city's green lungs. Millions of trees line walkways and cycleways. Copenhagen Harbour is clean enough for swimming. 4.07 p.m. New York. Building facades trap CO2 and produce methanol for use as fuel. Renewable energy, efficient buildings and clean transport create the cleanest air since the Industrial Revolution. In the harbour, the water is filtered by billions of native oyster. 5.36 p.m. London. Journeys across the city take people and packages from one mode of transport to another via mega hubs. When making plans to meet friends, your navigation assistant plans your route. The navigation assistant instantly reacts to outside events and changes your route. The journey is only two stops on the underground, and then it's just a short walk to the crystal. 1.07 a.m., the city at night. The city restocks, recharges, and recycles. Jobs that can be done overnight are automatically activated. Our future city never sleeps. Its cycle continues. So what you saw in, um, oops, what, what you saw in that video um, represents um, represented a number of Siemens businesses that existed uh, individually, uh, and but in the last several years, because of this research, because of our focus on sustainability and cities, we actually chose to reorganize our corporation to be as re um, responsive as possible to what we see as the, the greatest challenges of our future, which are around these cities. So we took a number of uh, individual standalone companies. And for those of you who have ever worked in a large corporation, you might understand what I'm talking about. But in a corporation as big as Siemens, sometimes you don't even know what the guy in the next office is even working on. And so even though you imagine that there's an amazing amount of coordination between businesses, a lot of times it just doesn't happen. It has to be, it has to really be driven and, and almost forced to work. And that's what Siemens decided to do. We reorganized our businesses and we created a new sector that we called infrastructure in cities. And infrastructure in cities represents um, it creates the structure to capture the growth potential of these new cities, right? And it, and it included, uh, included a lot of existing businesses such as mobility and logistics, uh, transportation, uh, building technology, smart grid application, uh, low and medium voltage, and, and it allows uh, us to represent all of these individual dis disparate solutions as one common solution for these, for these cities and for these customers. So, just to, just to understand how Siemens is organized today, we really have four sectors now, right? So we have energy, which is big energy, who sells turbines and wind turbines 
and uh, power transmission solutions to utilities. We have our healthcare business that sells everything from uh, MRIs and CAT scan machines to diagnostic tools. Uh, we have our industry business that has industrial automation and drive technology. And then we have this infrastructure in cities with these five businesses that we've rolled up into this one singular effort. And, um, and all of this is really being driven by this, these mega, the mega trend of, of uh, city growth. So uh, what does this mean that for us, this is a $236 billion a year euro, excuse me, 236 billion euro business. And just in 2011, with an expectation that, that our IC business is gonna grow at a greater rate than, than GDP worldwide. So this is, this is a big, big uh, initiative for us. Um, and we're looking to provide for the basic needs of a city. And, uh, and we have to be competitive and we have to be comprehensive in being able to provide these solutions. So um, again, all of, the, all, of those, all of those evaluation criteria in that index really can be addressed by the businesses we have within the infrastructure and cities segment. Rail systems uh, for public transportation, mobility and logistics, for traffic, um, uh, for traffic management, uh, low and medium voltage and smart grid in context of, of uh, moving energy back and forth between generators and consumers, and then building technology, which really is focused on making an individual building as efficient as possible. Um, so let me just run through some of these it, in some uh, quick high level. Um, The rail system, uh, Siemens, I don't know if you know this, but Siemens is one of the largest manufacturers of, of trains in the world. If you've ever been to San Diego, you know the red trolley that runs from Qualcomm and down through the city and down to the baseball field, that's a Siemens train. And uh, we currently have our products in um, parts of the LA Metro and, and, uh, and uh, Portland and a number of other cities that you've probably been in. In Europe, where you know, half of every train that you might you might enter is a Siemens train. Um, mobility and logistics. Again, the, the the focus is to accelerate traffic flow, which in, in in terms reduces CO2 emissions, and of course shortens commutes and improves quality of life. Uh, a key issue for cities everywhere, not just to from an environmental standpoint, but from a competitive standpoint. Businesses don't want to move to a city that where traffic is snarled. They want to move to a city where their employers, employees can travel to and fro as, as, as well as the goods and services they provide. Um, again, this low and medium voltage, it, we, may, we manufacture so much of the electrical infrastructure in almost every building, um, both in the United States and, and in Europe. Uh, things that you don't typically see, um, the, the, the transformers, the switchgear, the panels, uh, the low voltage distribution switchboard, uh, a number of different solutions. Um, smart grid. Does everyone, you must be familiar or at least have talked about the smart grid uh, from time to time. This is one of those things where um, it's more of an idea. There's no one tangible product that is the smart grid, um, but it's about information management and energy management. And as we evolve into a society that generates more and more of its energy from renewable resources like solar or wind, um, we need the ability to, to manage that energy flow uh, extremely effectively because ultimately these renewable sources, particularly wind and solar, they're, they're what we call non-dispatchable. In other words, you can't predict when they're actually going to generate electricity. Uh, a cloud will roll in and the, and the PV panels will no longer produce electricity. The wind will blow at 2 a.m. when the energy isn't needed, and then it's, there's no wind blowing at 2 p.m. when everyone needs additional electricity for their air conditioning systems. So the smart grid is critical as we move more and more towards, towards a renewable energy environment and a, and a um, decentralized power generation system. Uh, building technologies is actually the department that I work in within infrastructure and cities. And uh, buildings uh, actually consume 40% of all energy worldwide. 
And so it's a tremendous place for us to focus our efforts to, to deliver energy efficiency, because if we can have a substantial impact in of reducing that energy consumption by even 20%, then we've, we've reduced overall energy consumption and therefore emissions by 8% worldwide. Um, the other thing that we're focusing on is the faster growing areas, for example, data center solutions. Uh, data centers have made amazing developments just in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, when I first was in the business uh, uh, as a mechanical engineer, uh, I did a lot of work for banks and their data centers. And back in the early 90s, we used to keep data centers at 65 degrees, literally like a meat locker, because we all assumed that these computers and these these mainframes would operate much more effectively uh, and have much greater uptime at these low temperatures. Today, they're developing data centers that aren't even air conditioned. They simply are, are using ventilation and the temperatures in these data centers get up as high as, as 80 plus degrees. But the computers are, are perfectly able to function in this temperature. And so we're seeing a tremendous amount of energy efficiency being drained out of data centers simply because we're changing our attitudes about how to provide uh, provide the systems necessary for these data centers to remain online. Um, you know, one other example I want to highlight is is so much of of what Siemens does is is about uh, energy management and information management and and IT solutions. So. Uh, we're, we're, this example here is this vertical IT, uh, this growing market of, of vertical IT. And what does that mean? Well, it, it includes everything from, from our building technology information and our smart grid, but also to mobility and rail. And an example of this is um, we're using this, our IT solutions to help uh, expedite traffic flow in Tel Aviv. So we have a, what's called a hotline Right, a dynamic lane that could be shifted from inbound and outbound based on traffic patterns. And we're actually using our computer system to manage both um, the, the switching of the lane from inbound to outbound, as well as uh, tolling to change the behavior of, of the drivers on the road in order to uh, keep the traffic moving at its optimum speeds. Um, the other aspect of, of, of what Siemens is providing is, is these solutions are expensive, right? Whether we're talking about our healthcare solutions uh, with million dollar MRI and CAT scan machines to these smart grid solutions and uh, photovoltaic installations for municipalities. And so the way in which we can help facilitate these projects to happen is to, is to also provide financing. So within Siemens, we have Siemens Financial Sur Solutions and, and that simply means that we have an ability to, to give financial terms to customers to allow them to buy these, these expensive products and services. Um, you know, and obviously with 400,000 employees uh, headquartered in, in Munich, we, we have a, a tremendous global presence, uh, both in North America, Europe, Asia, South America, and Africa. A um, Couple of highlights uh, for us, uh, the work we've been doing in London, not only with the Crystal, um, but our work with uh, interurban mobility, automated video, video surveillance, uh, security is a big component of the solutions we're providing. And, and what we're finding is a lot of the, the same uh, computer systems that are used to manage the, the uh, energy systems of buildings can be the same computer systems to, to manage and control uh, security for these facilities as well. Uh, the hybrid buses and the transportation that we talked about, tolling systems, uh, to, to minimize and, and relieve congestion uh, and, uh, and, and smart grid. Uh, so we're doing work like that for London, uh, especially as we pointed out in that first, first bullet point, we started doing a lot of work with London in advance of their Olympics. Um, Shanghai uh, with train, uh, with their train systems and e-mobility. Um, And, uh, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the smart grid some more, but I think we're coming up on time. So um, let me just cover a few of the things that are more close to home before I run out of time. Um, 
Well, this is an interesting graph, so let me let me share this with you. So, um, I don't know if you've seen this before, but this is really about um, market development, and uh, you'll see a, a, a double dip curve here. Um, the vertical axis is the the visibility and adoption, and the horizontal is is the hype, right? And so we identified uh, the process of the of a market development of any new idea. So. We talk about the increasing, uh, this very steep line is, is how it's new ideas like smart grid or, or electric cars or hybrid cars. At first, they take off and pe capture people's imagination until it hits the peak of inflated expectations. From there, it drops off because people's expectations are too high. And so it hits the trough of dis disillusionment. And then finally, after people are disillusioned, uh, the, the actual expectations are reset and people uh, begin to uh, adopt the technology now that they have a better expectations. So just to put it in context, um, until it ultimately reaches the plateau of productivity. So uh, we put a couple of technologies on this just to sheet, just for you to see uh, what this means, right? So, so the smart grid right now is, is at that peak of inflated expectations. Right? Everyone talks about it and wants to talk about it, but uh, it's not really ultimately delivering on the expectations that people, people are looking for, and it's almost inevitable that people are going to become disillusioned and it'll drop off and only to recover again. Um, the electric car is already sort of on its way down. We saw a tremendous amount of hype when the Leaf came out, but the reality is that it hasn't lived up to the expectations. They haven't moved the number of cars that they expected. Um, the hybrid car has sort of gone through that trough and is now back climbing back up as being an accepted uh, product that people will use on a regular basis. Um, and then the, the other bullet point on the end here is green buildings and LEED certification. Um, now we're finding that almost you know everyone is is conversant in this in this in this description and, and everyone wants to talk about how their building ranks in context to to lead certification and sustainability. Um, I'm going to jump to this. Um, so we all live in Southern California. So I wanted to highlight a couple of places where this, this infrastructure in cities and sustainability um, pursuit is generating some traction uh, here in California. So um, recently we were awarded a grant in conjunction with the um, South Coast Air Quality Management District to take an idea that we started in Germany and to bring it back here to Southern California and, and develop it on the 710 freeway. Uh, what you're really looking at here is a cargo truck that's really running on electricity, right? But instead of uh, the same idea as an electric car like a LEAF where you're charging a battery and then running the car off of the energy stored in the battery, we're really running it off of a live power line uh, no different than you might have seen in a trolley um, and continue to see in a trolley or a light rail train. So the idea is if we can take the length of the 710 freeway from the port where cargo is coming in on ships up to the East LA, which is the, the hub of most of the, um, most of the um, warehousing district where it's eventually translated over to rail. Um, if we can take the, the freeway section of that and allow a truck to run with zero emissions, where normally they would be running on diesel, uh, and, then, and then when they get off that freeway, allow them to, to travel that last mile, so to speak, to their warehouse, their specific destination, and run on diesel, we could still eliminate more than 90% of the emissions of that entire trip. And by eliminating that much diesel, fumes and emissions, uh, if we did that for every truck that runs on the 710, we would be making an amazing improvement in air quality in Southern California. Um, could this be a future? It could be. Yes, sir. Do you know the speed of this or how it detaches and run Right. So, so I don't, but um, this picture is actually not of the 710 freeway. This is actually... A German, this is actually an Air Force base in Germany, a decommissioned American Air Force base, where they built this test bed. 
but the strategy is for these trucks to be able to drive at freeway speeds on electricity and then uh, transition to their diesel engine um, in, essentially instant, instantaneously. So this shouldn't change traffic speed or, or anything on the 710 freeway. What it will require, of course, is that the cargo truck has to drive in the lane that's under the, under the power line. So we'll eventually, if this were to take off, we would actually see a dedicated uh, truck lane, essentially. And, you know, where could this take us? I imagine a future where uh, that Nissan Leaf that only has a 100-mile range, right, on its battery, if it also had access, perhaps not an overhead power line, but perhaps a, a power source in the freeway itself, if we could drive an electric car that's driven real time off of electric power on a freeway, and then the battery is only needed, uh, used for surface treats, for example, now we could have a, uh, an electric car that might have an infinite range, or you could travel from Los Angeles to New York on a freeway uh, driven by a real live electric power, and, and only, those, only that last mile on the surface treats is actually run off of your battery. And, and suddenly, a product that very few people want to buy in Southern California because of the limited range has an unlimited range. Is that, is that possible? It, it could be. But for now, this experiment is about eliminating the most significant pollution uh, generator in Southern California, which is diesel trucks. So um, here's some other places where we're delivering uh, solutions. Uh, here on campus, uh, we've done a project here at UCI. Uh, we partnered to deliver an accelerated project to, to upgrade lighting systems. Um, <coughs> DC controls and HVAC equipment. Uh, this was several years ago, um, before I started working at Siemens. But you know, the project resulted in reducing 773,530 pounds of CO2 per year, and UCI, through our partnership, was able to receive a rebate uh, from the utilities and the CPUC of more than 2.1 million dollars. Um, and the project exceeded expectations, delivering a total annual savings of 1.24 million dollars. These are the kinds of projects that we're partnering with um, with universities on a regular basis. Uh, universities, colleges, K through 12 schools. Um, people who have uh, a large quantity and large inventory of square footage of buildings with a lot of air conditioning and heating and lighting and, and who also are looking, taking a long view, right? The, the corporate businesses, the for-profit businesses, you know, just like our business, we have a profit motive, and that drives us to behave in a certain way. But, but the, the, the municipal agencies and the, the state universities and not-for-profit organizations, you know, they have a sense of permanence and a sense of, of uh, take a much longer perspective and are willing to do projects that have paybacks that are much longer than what a for-profit company would examine. Um, another example of, of the solutions we're providing is that the city of Anaheim we are able to take uh, a substation that you see the old substation in the bottom corner, which is obviously not something that anyone would want to live next to, and uh, replace that with an underground uh, substation and put a park on top. And, and suddenly what was a horrible place to have to raise your kid next to, right, is suddenly a place that people want to live next to uh, because it's safe and green and, and an attractive place to allow your kids to play. Um, another example is, uh, you know, we've partnered with large cities like the city of Houston, and we've uh, saved the city over $5 million a year. Um, so how are we going to help sustainability in the future? Well, we're a big part of it, the educational process. Uh, Siemens, because we're one of the largest employers of engineers on Earth, we are very invested in encouraging people into the engineering field. So we donate a lot of money and create a lot of programs around uh, STEM programs um, because it's, it's partially in our self-interest. Um, and, and they're fantastic programs. Um, we obviously are a, a, a big investor in, in, in new innovation. This is a highlight of um, tidal power generation. Uh, that, that potentially could be a, a, a new and significant power source in the future. Um, you know, there, it's not all good news, though. In the last week, there's been a couple of new pieces of information that 
that have come out that have certainly troubled me, and I'm sure you've, you've seen them as well. Um, on May 8th, um, for the first time in recorded history, they, uh, since we started measuring this information, uh, we've surpassed the 400 uh, parts per million of CO2 in, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere. And, and that represents the, the highest levels of CO2 in more than 3 million years of Earth history. And uh, it, in the time in which we last had 400 parts per million, the seas were 30 feet higher than they are today. And uh, I think you can all go back to the slide of the United States and the, and the population densities and realize what an impact 30 foot higher sea levels would make on these, these metropolitan areas. Um, and just the other day, uh, Newsweek, which of course is no longer printed, but is available online, they issued a, uh, an article called, Can Humans Survive? The Sixth math, Mass Extinction is Upon Us. Um, and really what they're advocating in this article is that it's no longer good enough for us to just stop doing bad things. We actually have to start doing, uh, proactively taking action, doing things to, to change the course that we're on. And uh, if you haven't read the article, I encourage you to, and they also refer to this book, uh, Scatter, Adapt, and Remember. Um, so is it too late? Uh, and does this mean everything has changed? I, I, I don't think it does. I think that people, because this is such a slow-moving calamity, I think that behavior is still going to be driven by that joke that I showed on the first or second slide, which is economic drivers, right? Um, I used to work at a regulated utility, and there was an old joke that the, that the CEO of a regulated utility was going to commit suicide, so he jumped in front of a glacier. I, you probably don't find that as funny as I did. But, um, <laughs> but that's sort of what we're doing right now. We're kind of committing suicide by jumping in front of a glacier, and it moves so slow no one, it's not enough of an emergency for anyone to take immediate action. But people will respond to economic stimuli, and there is a role to be played in every aspect of, of life to drive towards making this, making these solutions happen, right? At Siemens, my job is to get in front of customers and encourage them basically to separate their money from their wallet to do energy efficiency projects that, yeah, is going to save them a lot of money, but it's also going to help save the planet because it's going to reduce energy emissions, uh, energy consumption, and it's going to reduce emissions from power plants. Their motivation is going to be, it's going to save them money. But my motivation is I, I want to reduce the emissions. And by working for Siemens, um, it allows me, it gives me, it affords me the opportunity to get in front of these clients, make a compelling case, and try to drive action. So that's why I work at Siemens. That's why I do what I do. Uh, thanks for sticking with me throughout that presentation. And if we have enough time for questions, I'm happy to uh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. You know, everyone has their greater angels that you can appeal to. Um, and some people can be persuaded uh, by the greater good. Um, but, you know, if you're talking to a publicly traded company, you know, the reality is if you're not paying attention to the, the profits, and if you're not paying attention to the financial results, and, and you know, on, on a quarter by quarter basis, you're not gonna have that job, right? So you have to attend to the economic. If you're employed by one of these companies, you have to attend to the economic. So uh, in my mind, the goal is, my job, my job is to 
articulate the entirety of the economic benefit that is going to be derived by one of these projects. Now, when I say one of these projects, what I sell specifically, what my business sells and then we implement is energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. So I come into a building like this and I'll take out those lights and put in more energy efficient LED lights. I'm going to put solar panels on the roof. I'm going to change out the, the switch gear to make it more efficient so that instead of 90%, it'll be 93%. Right, efficient, so more of the energy is actually getting to the to the systems. And a lot of it's not very sexy, and a lot of it's equipment behind a closet that no one even looks at or even wants to look at. Um, and so I have to I have to come I have to make a compelling argument and make a compelling case about what the monetary benefit is. And some things are easy to quantify, energy cost savings. Everyone gets an electric bill and they have to pay it and they know it. So how much money it is, and they can rip it out and, and calculate, well, I can save you 20% of that. But it's the other benefits that we, that we have to work really hard to quantify. Hey, if your building is, is a more efficient energy consuming system and it has a lead, a lead plaque or an energy star plaque in the lobby, there's gonna be a certain uh, constituency of employees or customers that are gonna be impressed by that. So there's a marketing angle you can play. You want to get that plaque in the lobby because that's going to attract uh, new employees. That's going to attract new customers. Um, there is a there is a quality of of uh, 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 a life health quality aspect, right? By taking out old air conditioning system that's rusted and and perhaps moldy and replacing it with new air conditioning equipment, the the, the air quality in the building is going to be better. They're going to have less. Uh, illness, uh, less absenteeism, and, and greater productivity. Our job is to is to to list every conceivable benefit and monetize it, right? And to say, look, this has this dollar value. But yes, there are certain people that will absolutely are interested in, in in the greater good. There absolutely are. But you know, the companies that are usually that seem to be motivated by that, they they are. I'm not saying they're not. But they also realize it's a powerful marketing message, right? Patagonia wants to be seen as being an environmental company because the people who buy their products are environmentalists, right? Of course, they have to, they have to be able to represent themselves in that framework. Otherwise, their customers won't buy their products. But we can quantify that. We can, we can dollarize what that benefit is and show them the economic benefit of two more customers buying the products, or 2,000 more customers buying the products. Yes? Well, the typical definition of sustainability is, is, to, is to meet our current needs without detracting future generations from being able to meet their needs as well. Um, So Siemens, because we're catering to customers, you know, we really want to mirror whatever their, their own definition of sustainability is. Now, we have our own, right? And we, we walk it like we talk it, right? We have our rail plants up in Sacramento. We have solar panels on the roofs. We look to, to do energy efficiency product, projects within our own facilities. When we built the Crystal, we made sure that we put in the most efficient system possible to be LEED certified, but again, you know, we wanted that plaque in the lobby. We wanted people to know it's it's a it's a it's a showcase of that exact thing. My definition is is you know, and th this change happens, I guess, when you have kids. But you know, I look at my four-year-old kid and I say to myself, "Geez, you know, I want I want him to be able to live in a world that is is good and is is livable and and." And I want his kids to, to live in a world that can sustain life, you know? Well, that's a good question. Um, yes, I'm not in the product side, so I, I'm not part of the business that makes widgets, but, um, but Siemens is very serious about that. There's a, there's a certification in Europe, Europe called, somebody help me out here, Rees, Rose? It's a manufacturing, 
I should know that. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's a framework for um, for for green manufacturing, and yes, we comply with that because it, it, again, it's important to us to demonstrate that we are not just talking about it in a sales pitch, but actually walking and living in it every day. You know, I, I am a part of a global organization, uh, but I am a, a local representative of that global organization. I, you know, I don't personally deal with with issues of life and death, right? I, I'm not. I'm, I'm dealing in Southern California. You know, life and death for me is whether you survive your commute on the 405 freeway. But you know, the rest of the world is is in a totally different situation. And Siemens are in those markets. We are. Um, I, I don't really know. I don't know what. I don't. I can't tell you what our position is on that. To be frank. I'm sure. I'm sure we have a very significant position. I just can't tell you what it is. Not at all. So when you mean human life, do you mean like like human life in terms of of countries that don't um, support human rights, like in Africa or parts of? So we're not really in those markets. We supply products to mines. So um, amongst other things, um, it's not really an issue for us directly. Everything we manufacture is, is basically high-tech manufacturing. Most of it is actually done in places like the United States and Germany. You know, we're not manufacturing in the third world, for example. Uh, but right, I mean, the, the, some of our customers, mines is a good example. I mean, we, we manufacture a tremendous amount of equipment that are used by mines. We're not the mine, but those products might be used in, in, in places where, you know. So we're kind of like a step removed from that. Um, you know, look, there are a million problems to deal with on Earth, trust me, I, and I appreciate that. Um, and that's a significant one. I'm, I'm not going to downplay that in any shape or form. You know, human rights, human dignity, and and you know, basic protection for citizens by their government are is critical, and it's perhaps one of the most important issues we could we could help solve. It's not the issue that I'm trying to help solve. I'm trying to help solve this other issue, right? Still, in my opinion, an extremely important one, um, and I guess I'm hoping that somebody else is working on that. Yes, sir. Okay. And what was the second question? And my second question is um, uh, how can uh, manufacturers in Chicago or just in general become more sustainable and ultimately reduce CO2 emissions in that region? 
Okay, so to answer your first question, I think Chicago landed, well, obviously it's somewhere between 11 and 17. <laughs> I was really expecting it to be on that list. Um, I, I know I gave you those that document, you could actually, right, let, me, let me answer that question. Um, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And as speaking as someone who did an internship in Chicago in 1991 in a fifth floor of a five-story walk-up with no air conditioning, I can assure you that, that the heat is real and it definitely is, has the potential to drive people to a homicidal rage. Um, <laughs> But you know, a, a huge city like like Chicago, you know, it, it's it really becomes a heat island, right? So all of those buildings packed in next to each other are all rejecting heat from the air conditioning system to the outside environment, which is all paved, right? And there's just no place for the heat to go. So the the, the heat in the city, yeah, it can be stifling. It really can be. And um, you know, the solution to that problem is is um, the solution to that problem is all the things that we're talking about, energy efficiency, reduction of, of, of car traffic, bus traffic, uh, diesel traffic, but you know, it's also uh, planting of, of, of trees and other greenery. That, that makes a, a huge impact. And, you know, just, and then it just comes down to money, right? I mean, you need to have money in order to, to, to not only plant trees, but to take care of trees as well. So uh, Chicago is actually, a really fantastic city and very livable. I think there's probably a lot more issues than just the temperature at play and the, the homicide rates, I'm sure. But, uh, okay, 48. Let's see what we got here. So Chicago ranked, um, 19th in CO2, 8, 18th, 8th in energy, 15th in land use, 14th in buildings, 6th in transportation, 12th in water, 14th in waste, 15th in air, and 12th in environmental governance, with an overall ranking of, well, I don't know. Let's see here. <laughs> There we go. Um, overall, Chicago, 11. So, in context to uh, in context to all those other cities that you see up here, they're just one step behind Minneapolis. So, actually, a pretty high ranking. I'll be curious to to see the results of your study, but it does get crazy, crazy hot, and really humid, actually. Uh, yes. So, um, did I mention I've been on board for 18 months? Okay. So, but I will, t I will tell, I will tell you this. So, um, th there were, there were, at the beginning of the presentation, I was talking about the Green City Index, which is this slide, and then there was this other study that we started doing where we're interviewing corporate, um, corporate executives about sustainability. The first study came out in 2006. So, in the mid 2000s is when is when Siemens really started to realize that as an engineering and a technology company, we had this portfolio of businesses that can really be organized to address this, the issues around sustainability. So it was somewhere in the early to mid 2000s, and that's when we started taking the actions that you're seeing the results of. The, the Green City Index, the corporate surveys of sustainability, the, the building of the crystal, it, it was really in that mid 2000s you know for years though we manufactured the the the, the products necessary to, to deliver s sustainable projects um, but 
you know, it's interesting. For a, for a long time, we manufactured solar panels, but solar panels became a complete commodity, uh, and there's there's no profit left in panels. They could be manufactured in China for a fraction of the cost as they could, we could manufacture them in Germany and the United States, and so we stopped making them. So, and that's okay, right? I still do solar projects all the time, and I use uh, panels, manufactured, sometimes manufactured in Taiwan, sometimes manufactured in the United States. Uh, sometimes I use Siemens inverters that convert DC to AC. Um, sometimes I use someone else's inverters. So we're still delivering the projects. We're just not manufacturing the components that are commoditized and, and have you know, they, they've reached the maturity level of their project lifespan, if you will. Do you see your competitors looking at the like Oh, absolutely. Like yeah, absolutely. I mean, our competitors are very broad because we're such a very broad company. But, you know, we compete against Johnson Controls and Honeywell. We compete against General Electric. We compete against Schneider. Um, we compete against ABB. Um, with any number of corporations, and all of these companies have different various degrees of, of, of sustainable focus. Uh, I think Siemens is the only one that's really focusing on, on sustainable cities in particular. We've, we've selected that as our, our real mantra and our really to differentiate us uh, from our competitors. And, and some of the slides that I was I felt like I needed to skip over in order to get to this conversation part. You know, it's not just that we organized the business around this. We created new positions with city account managers uh, across the world that whose responsibility is to connect with the leaders of these large cities. There's one here in Los Angeles, who, someone who worked in, in the city government himself for several years, and his job is to connect Siemens uh, infrastructure and cities businesses with with the city of Los Angeles, with the city of San Diego, with the cities of Riverside, and, and et cetera, et cetera, to, to highlight how we can deliver solutions across a broad range of challenges. Um, I'm just wondering if you guys worked out at the end of like, the use of I'm sorry, I didn't. I did not hear your question. Um, I'm just wondering if you guys work. Um, you're developing technology, uh, but if you work on the technology that's being left behind. Work on the technology that's being left behind. Um, oh, I see. Um, Yes, um, a lot of the a lot of the we make physical products like turbines and switch gear and what have you and and uh, you know a lot of times these pieces of equipment have a lot of valuable products or materials in them, copper, um, gold, and so when the old product is being dismantled, usually it's worth. A large amount of money, and and that material is 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 recycled because the materials inside of it are so valuable. Um, it, from a context of our computer systems, are our, our, uh, like building automation systems. So you know we're one of the things we pride ourselves on is is every year as we come up with a new version of the building automation systems, we always make sure that it's compatible with previous releases so that people aren't left with a, a device on their wall that's, that's antiquated and, and essentially has to be abandoned and replaced. It can be upgraded with the software upgrades as we develop them. So we, we definitely take a, a sustainable approach to new product releases and, and replacing the older releases, if that answers your question. Yes, sir. Well, we're we're um, we're a major player in in Asia. Um, let me see if I can get to the 
So, I mean, we're, we're, we're in Asia, and, and we're substantially involved in India, China, Southeast Asia, and, you know, again, we, the things that we make are highly specialized, highly technical, extremely precise, and, and it's not the kind of products that lend themselves to be outsourced to, to like, low-tech low manufacturing uh, so a lot of our products are still made in places like Germany, in the United States. Um, and we do manufacture products in Asia, but it's extremely high-end manufacturing, if, if, if that makes any sense. It's extremely, it's extremely uh, complicated and high-tech manufacturing processes. So I, I don't personally get involved in the Asian markets. Um, and in and, and my 18 months, quite frankly, I haven't been to Asia, but, um, but I know we're a major player there. And then I wish I could give you better details on that. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, I'm not sure I, you okay? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I totally understand uh, the point that you're trying to drive there. Um, you know, the, the, the crystal is, is really a convention center and it's available for people to use and it can be rented out, if that's what you're talking about. Um, Oh, okay, yeah. So, so look, you know, the crystal is intended to be a showcase, and as a showcase, we're building things beyond the norm, right? Because you know, everyone's seen solar panels. I mean, if you in Germany, literally everything has solar panels on it. Um, so, if we just did solar panels alone, it wouldn't be much of a showcase. So, you know, we we went to somewhat extremes, economic extremes, right? Things that don't really have a payback today because we're trying to show what technologies might be become the norm in the future, right? Um, you know, what we're seeing is, is, is an evolution based on the economic drivers that we were talking about earlier, right? When, when electricity was five cents a kilowatt hour, it didn't even make sense to bother putting in a control system. You just let, let everything on all the time, right? But it was only when, you know, in that first energy crisis in the 70s, when, when the oil embargo happened and, and oil, oh, energy prices jumped significantly, people really started changing their behavior. And, and every time we see these economic conditions change, prices change, regulation change, sometimes taxes change, right, um, it drives people's behaviors differently. And so the things that we installed at the Crystal might not be economically viable for most companies today, but they probably will be in the future. And, and um, Siemens will be there to, to implement those projects for customers when, when they're economically viable. And if people want to do them today, I'll, we'll absolutely do them and finance them. You know, the challenge is, you know, for people like me, I have to come in and make a, a compelling argument to somebody to make an investment to either spend the money or take on the debt necessary to, to install these solutions. And, and if I can't show them that there's a return within a, a certain amount of a time, then most people aren't going to do it. But, you know, the reality is um, <laughs> the, things, the things that have 15-year paybacks today in a couple of years, they're going to have a five-year payback. And it's going to be driven by two things. It's partially it's going to be driven 
as we see with photovoltaic panels, cost of a panel has gone from $2 a watt down to 65 cents a watt, right? And simultaneously, the price of energy has gone from 10 cents to 15 cents to 20 cents. And uh, it's when you get that, those two dynamics is when things become economically viable very quickly. And then just to, just to add on top of that, things like um, AB32 in California, which is sort of off to a slow start, but the idea of, of a cap and trade on, on CO2 emissions where you're penalizing or taxing people based on, on pollution, that's going to be a part of that economic calculus that, that drives the return on investments higher, there's paybacks lower, and you're going to see more and more of these projects that were just you know, seen in places like the Crystal, Crystal or the Energy Resource Center in Downey or, or, uh, or the showcases at SeaTac for, for Southern California Edison, you're going to see a lot more of those projects installed because they're going to be economically viable. Any other questions? I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, and um, good luck with your journey.